behind this is, is that I was in one of my online groups. And what happened was, is that yesterday someone was asking for clothing donations. Um, they didn't ask for any sweaters, they didn't ask for any coats. But one of the replies, someone had mentioned that they had a vintage fur coat. And if they wanted, you know, they would be happy to donate it. Now, this was yesterday, today in the morning, I messaged them and I said, hey, did that person get back to you? Because if not, I'd be interested in a fur coat. But let me know what size it is. So this fur coat, from what I was told, is a vintage fur coat. It's from the 1970s. Um, allegedly, it's rabbit fur. I don't know if this is rabbit fur. You know, I'm not too familiar with my furs, but there is no label. Um, you can see that how the lining is, and this this coat just just to bring it uh, bring it home to you guys. This coat is 40 to 50 years old, and for being a 40 to 50 year old coat still in circulation, kind of surprising. You know, I don't see any any like Hollister clothes or any. You know, a, a lot of the clothes that we have nowadays, I don't think people are going to be wearing it in 40 to 50 years. But something like this lasts. Um, for a long time. Now, furs, as I mentioned in my community post, has been around for about 170,000 years. It dates back to the Stone Age, you know, way before all this faux fur stuff. I know there's been a push for faux fur and people will say, oh, we'll buy faux fur because it's environmental and things like that. Faux fur is made out of like polyester, acrylic, plastic stuff and plastic um, polyester, that sort of thing, has only been around for the last hundred years. It's not as insulating as real fur, and it takes about 500 to 1,000 years to degrade. You know, the, the, the fake, uh, fake fur stuff. This, if I buried it in the ground in a hole, besides the buttons, because the buttons are plastic, everything will basically disintegrate within one year, or with definitely within two years. So, when I when I hear about this like strong anti fur sentiment, I get it. I, I understand that, you know, you've probably seen some of the stuff that comes out from like China factories or mass produced stuff. But I don't like the idea of people treating it blanket statement like, oh, um, if you have a jacket from 40 years ago, you should get rid of it because it's real fur and instead replace it with a full fur alternative. You know, and I know, a lot of people are not going to be keeping their faux furs for about 40 to 50 years. And faux furs, it, it, it like, um, how would I say this? Like, I've had, I have some faux fur stuff. When it sheds, it's just plastic. So you wash it, it goes right into, it goes right into the ocean versus this stuff. It's made out of natural fibers. Now, the downside about a real fur jacket and it's, I can only say this partially because I have another fur jacket that I bought vintage, I think last year. Yeah, I bought it last year. Is, is that it, well, of course this jacket, it, you know, you can see this part came out. It's, not, it's like a really easy fix. This part's a really easy fix. But the, the things, oh, where is it? There's a hole in here somewhere because it has actually started to separate. Let me show it to you guys. Where is it? I don't mind poking and prodding this stuff. Oh, here it is. So there's a hole right here. See that? See that? So this would need to be get, this would actually need to get repaired. And I don't trust myself repairing this stuff. Um, so you could bring it over to like a local furrier and these people specialize in repairing furs and taking care of this stuff. Now, I know some of you have, um, some of you might know relatives who have vintage furs, grandmothers, uh, moms, that sort of thing. I do not believe, and this is just my personal stance, if you have a relative who has a fur coat, I think you should keep it. I think you should keep it. I think you should wear it. I think it's a good way to, to you know, use what they, have, what they have kept in their closets for a number of years, provided, provided that it fits you, okay? If it's like too big or too small on you, then definitely rehome it. There are organizations that you can donate fur coats to. Um, they do use it to rehab or orphaned animals, for instance. Um, you know, uh, when animals are rescued, maybe, um, you know, if, if animals are rescued, sometimes that they have like newborns and then the newborns find comfort in fur coats. Um, it, it's kind of soothing to them. I've also heard that, you know, animals like being around fur because it just, it has like a calming effect on them. And I can't really talk much about calming effect on a scientific level with humans, but I'm gonna be honest with you. 
If you guys are familiar with a weighted blanket, I'm a big fan of weighted blankets. We have a weighted blanket here, but we're not really using it right now. But um, a weighted blanket, it's good for calming down anxiety because it has this, it has this weight and it's like an all over weight. And it's just like a really warm hug. You, ca you guys can look up weighted blankets um, for more details about that. A fur coat has natural weight to it. So because it's soft and because it has like this very comforting weight to it, it feels like a gentle, nice hug. And if, if you guys don't understand what I'm talking about, I would say go to your local thrift store, go to a consignment store, th try on a vintage coat, and you'll understand where I'm coming from. Um, I was kind of surprised because I remember the first time I tried on a vintage coat, um, actually it wasn't last year, it was 2019 when I bought it. Um, when I first tried it on, I thought it was going to be stuffy and, um, you know, heavy or uh, not comfortable. But I was so shocked because when I tried on a fur coat, I was like, wow, this is really nice. Um, it's not it's not because it's nice because of how it looks, really, but it's nice because it has this really nice weight to it. It doesn't feel like I'm just having like a, a bath towel around me. It's 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 it has a comforting weight to it. So this jacket has like that same kind of weight. Of course, it's heavier than a, a traditional like a fabric jacket. And I like it a lot. Um, the only downside, okay, see, there's another tear right here. So this this stuff does have to be taken care of. It does need to get repaired. So you got one tear over there. I think there's probably another tear over here. And it's just because after a while, because it is a natural product, you know, it starts in the process of degrading. And um, I don't know how much repairs cost. I really don't know how much repair is, but I imagine it adds up. So see, look, we got another tear over here another tear over here so this is proof to you guys that yes this stuff does degrade it does go in the stage of uh slowly slowly going back into the earth and if you do want to upkeep this kind of stuff you would have to bring it to professional because if you don't bring it to a professional or um you know you'll you'll end up with more and more little splits over here um i don't mind it uh i gotta i i kind of want to actually see if i can repair it myself because now that i'm thinking about it i got one two three three over here and then i got like one over here and yeah i think this would be actually a pretty costly repair pretty costly but i'm not too sure maybe i can get some maybe i can try to figure out how to do it myself who knows but um Overall, overall, I really like this coat. Um, it's a little, it, it fits me perfectly, minus the sleeves are just like one fourth of an inch too short. It's weird because it's like these vintage coats. I don't know how the sizing was back then, but it fits me a lot better than the standard stuff. Now, like if I get a, if I get like a standard coat, most of the times it's like the arms are too long or it just looks really bulky. This one actually fits me pretty damn well. Um, the downside about this is, like I said, maintenance costs. Um, okay, Andrea said it's the it's the the threads. Yeah, so I'm not too confident about my repairing abilities on this kind of stuff. But so I might bring it over to a furrier, or who knows? Maybe I'll try to see. But see, like over here, one. You got one hole over here. Two over here. Three. Four. So it can be repaired five but uh it is it is something so again this was a gift given to someone and it was already vintage and they decided to part with it they decided you know they'll give it away and uh now i have it um another thing is so i'm not too i'm not like i said i'm not too sure if this is rabbit fur or not i'm not very familiar with my furs for obvious reasons but whatever fur this is, it is short and yeah, I don't, I don't know. I've never seen a rabbit with this kind of fur. Then again, I, I don't really see too many rabbits in my life. Um, but uh, yeah, I like it. I like it. Um, again, I do not recommend buying new furs. I think there's a lot of old furs out there. If you want to have like a piece that can last you a while, but be, be mindful, right? There is repair work that you may have to do on this stuff. Um, I would say definitely get a fur coat. Um, a fur coat, my, my whole thing with my fur coats is this. So I have two fur coats. I have this one and another fur coat. I want these coats to last a very long time. Um, 
These coats that I have, this one's for like 40, 50 years old, allegedly. The other one is, I don't know, maybe it's 40 years old or so. But I want to see how long it lasts. You know, will a fur coat last me another 30 years? Will it last longer than that if I keep up with um, making sure that it gets repaired when it does need to get repaired? And uh, I don't believe in fast fashion. You guys know that a lot of this like stuff that gets tossed out into the landfills, it saddens me when I know it doesn't degrade. And I was talking to Lewis about this today. He was saying that he didn't, you know, he didn't like the fur coat because it's fur. And what I had told him, I said, you understand that a lot of this like polyester acrylic stuff was plastic. This was only made within like the last hundred years. So it's kind of backwards that as a society, we have gone so, you know, because of the last hundred years, we have decided that it's better to just buy more plastic and not go with natural fabrics, natural fibers, since, yeah, for whatever reason, uh, and I understand animal rights here, but um, it's just like we're, we're being conditioned to think, yeah, it's, it's, it's better, it's more ethical to buy the, the, the polyester, the acrylic, the, the you know, uh, the fake plastic petroleum stuff that doesn't degrade over what we were using for 170,000 years and, um, how I how I see this kind of stuff being in the future, I think that it's, it's like a toss up. Um, I also think it's kind of not good to to wear like really flashy furs. So I was bringing this home today, and it was inside of this Dwayne Reed bag, and the, it was like a crummy looking bag, but about ten percent of it was popping out. So just like ten percent of this, right? And then someone approached me and she said that she wanted my my coat. And I was shocked because I was I looked down, I looked at the bag and I thought, "Wait, what?" And I it didn't real it didn't dawn on me that like this woman, even though I was I had 90% of this coat covered, she saw the 10% and she felt compelled to tell me that she was noticing my coat. So, um in these kind of times I don't think wearing a coat like this on the street is really a good idea. Um, I mentioned to you guys in one of my previous streams that uh, I, I mentioned to you guys in one of my previous streams that when I was at the park, I noticed someone with a Canada goose jacket and they had the coyote fur lining on there. Now, um, the thing about coyotes is, is although animal rights activists like to be like, oh, see the coyotes, any person who's a farmer will recognize that coyotes kill livestock um they can they kill pets you can look that up online so when farmers are hunting coyotes it's not because they are sadistic murderers it's because they want to protect their livestock um, there have been many accounts of coyotes killing dogs and killing cats and when they when they kill it's not like a it, it's pretty brutal it's pretty horrific so um the coyotes that are being killed it's not because this is like a cute little pomeranian you get you get it? So it irks me a little when I hear about these people who are also urban dwellers just like me who think like, oh, yeah, you know, we should we shouldn't use coyote fur because, yeah, why why do we have to kill the coyotes? We, we can just let them live in peace. They can live in harmony. And these people have probably never, ever farmed in their life. They have never, ever um, seen like a documentary about how farming really is and how destructive coyotes can be the same thing with the beavers right beavers and um beavers can do a lot of damage they can cause flooding and then raccoons and foxes sometimes they call it because of rabies concern as too so when it comes down to fur there are some there are some uh animals that are already being culled because they need to keep the numbers in check. And it's not just like people are, people are killing them for the sake of killing them. There's a reason behind it. Um, I don't know if you guys are familiar with any like beaver damage, but from what I was reading online, like, yeah, they, these things can be pretty destructive. So um, I just, yeah, it's like things like that. Like when I, when I look more into certain things, like, yes, I think some people, like when we, when we think about mink farming, right? It's like, a, it's like a, it, it depends on the farms because I've read stories where people say like they work on a mink farm and they're being anonymous and they say, we take really good care of our minks. And then when, after they harvest the fur, then they, then they use the meat from the minks and then they compost it. And then they use that, and they use that, um, and that in the manure to nourish fields. So 
there's not really much waste when it comes to the mink farm. So I hear about that side about it, but then you also hear about the PETA activists who say stuff like, oh, you know, why are you killing the mink? The mink, um, you don't need to kill the mink. Just wear synthetic faux furs if you really want to, or don't even wear synthetic faux furs because then you're pushing people to buy furs. And uh, if you buy a really good synthetic faux fur, in my opinion, a really, really good one, because I've seen like synthetic faux furs go for like $300. And it, to me, at least at, like the online images, they look really good. I don't really see the point to buying a synthetic, a really authentic looking synthetic faux fur, because if it looks like the genuine thing, people are going to think it's a genuine thing. Very rarely will people go up to you and say, oh, is this real or is this fake? And then if you tell them, oh, it's fake, people, are, what are people going to do? Oh, okay. How much is it? Oh, it was like $300, $400, right? People aren't. Yeah. So you can buy a vintage fur, um, depending on where it is, for um, for quite a good price. Um, it's I think part of it is because the demand is kind of low. And then again, you got maintenance that you have to do on this, but I don't really care too much about it. I'm curious to see how much it would cost me if I um, brought it over to a furrier. Curious, but the, the bad thing is, is all the furriers that I know is, um, that I see online is all in Manhattan. And you know, Manhattan's gonna be really freaking expensive. So uh, I'm very tempted to just try and do the repair myself. And then if it looks a little wonky, well, oh well, um, but. Yeah, there is a way to fix these kind of coats. It's like this one. Wait, let me show this. Like this one, you can see that there was one stitch over here, and then this stitch came in. So I could do this this one easily by myself, but uh, maybe it'll be like a little small project for me. Um, but I kind of still want to get a quote from a furrier and see what they what they recommend. Yeah. So. Um, that is all I wanted to say about this. Uh, I'm happy that I was able to rehome it. It fits me. If in the event that it didn't fit me, I would have passed it on into the community. And uh, okay, so so anonymous individual says I can vouch for the fact that beavers can be a huge problem in the boggy areas where I was raised. Beavers kept flooding my neighbor's property. Okay. So we have one person vouching for the destruction of beavers. And uh, that is something that, again, people need to keep into mind. Um, if you, when, when animals are being harvested for their pelt, and it might not just be because a hunter wants to kill it just for the sake of killing it. It could be because they want to protect their property or, you know, they recognize how destructive um, um, they, they recognize how destructive the animal can be. So I shared with you guys uh, in my community post that there's this thing called a nutria rat and nutria uh, they are known for eating the vegetation in marshes and they can contribute to uh, flooding because what happens is that when they eat the roots it's like the the, the ground doesn't it, it just creates these holes and then it creates more and more um, like water flooding shall I say so there's um, this, I think it's the state of Louisiana. They have like the $6 bounty telling people, hey, if you kill the nutria, we're going to pay you $6. And what some of these people do is they eat the nutria rat because it is edible or they harvest the pelts. And then you can use the pelts to make a coat or to make a, um, a scarf or to make a hat. I have zero problem. I have zero problem. If I was if I was to go out to like Louisiana, I have zero problem shooting the nutria rat to help save the Louisiana marshlands and then having a nutria rat coat made because I see it as it's like you're you're trying to save the environment from ter you know having all this destruction from the nutria rat. But then you're also going to have people who say like, "Oh, why do you have to kill the nutria rat? You don't have to kill the nutria rat. Why don't you just uh you know, let them be at peace or don't harvest their furs just because the furs belong to them. And I just don't see the sense to it. If you have to kill an animal to, to for pest control or try to save your environment, my stance is, is that harvest as much as you can from it. If, if you can harvest the meat, harvest the meat. If you can harvest the fur, harvest the fur, because that way less stuff goes to waste. And um, another example of this for invasive species is there's a thing called the Asian carp. The Asian carp, I believe it's in the Great Lakes. They are incredibly, incredibly destructive. They're eating a lot of like the small fish, the native small fish. And they've been um, doing things like making electric, I wanna say like electric barriers to kill them. And there's such a low demand for this fish. I guess only the Asians really like eating it. Um, 
that and they have a lot of bones too but they've been thinking about making fish cake out of it it hasn't been really that i i think that they haven't really ramped up on that but if they did make asian carp fish cake i would be in line buying that stuff and i'll say you know what? i support eating asian carp because the best way to get rid of invasive species is eating them or using you you know using the furs that kind of thing and that way if you drive demand for that people can make a little bit more money the people who are you know trying to get these numbers under control and then you're supporting small businesses you know the fish cake manufacturer or the the small the small enterprise that makes like a fur coat or something like that and hopefully you know it, it stimulates the economy a little bit more i just don't believe in getting rid of pests and then just saying yeah well we're just gonna we're just gonna bury them or we're just gonna toss them back in the ocean because that's the right thing to do you get what i'm saying So I don't know too much about beavers, um, but I've heard about how destructive they are. I don't know too much about the numbers. I think across the board, everybody can say there is no push to save the nutria rat. However, if I think PETA heard wind of this, they would probably say, no, you should have killed the nutria rat because you're killing it all oh, for frick's sake. Yeah, so... Um, I think that if you are going to, you know, if you're going to be harvest, harvesting something, use as much as you can. Some people, they eat um, lamb, and uh, one of the byproducts of lamb is lanolin or uh, sheepskin. It's just using everything that you can, you know, having less waste um, go into, um, into like landfills or you know try to compost it as much as you can so some mink farms they've been doing this i don't know about all all across the board um but yeah you can you can you can use the meat compost it use it as fertilizer with the manure of minks and then spread it on the fields and yeah it's and then a business makes money off of the fur so it's it's nourishing the ground in that sense i think that's much better than just saying like, yeah, we're just gonna toss the meat away or just throw it away. So that's um, one of the reasons why I do not buy any fur from China. So China, I think they're they're not so good when it comes to animal rights, and I can't I can't gauge how new fur is. So I don't feel comfortable buying new fur from China. If it's something like if if I saw like Louisiana uh, businesses were selling a Nutria coat or Nutria hat, like, I'd be like, yeah, let's, let's, let's support them, you know, let's support small businesses in Louisiana, see how that is, but with China, it's like, frick, some of the stuff that I've seen is pretty horrific, so, uh, I don't know where this coat was made, but 40 to 50 years ago, yeah, not bad. Uh, let's see here. Nah, some people, um, yeah, <laughs> Outseeker, you should need to show feet. Yeah, I don't really have much to show, but, um, yeah, I'm not really big on showing my feet, Mike, just saying here. <laughs> so what else was I going to say over here? When I was in Iceland, the guy told us there was a mink problem. They're not native there, and they're so wrecking environment, so they caught them for furs. Yeah, so uh, that's the problem. Like when you have when you harvest animals for fur, like if you farm them, right? Sometimes a few can a few of them can escape. That's what happened in Louisiana. Um, they were being bred for their furs, and then a bunch of them escaped. And here's something that pissed me off that I was I saw online. Okay, so you got some people who are anti mink, and I understand it. I understand the anti-meek mentality because some of the stuff that happens is pretty horrific. But, 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 I saw this video that was um, videotaped in Sweden. You had some animal rights activists going out there, and you know what they did? They released thousands of mink, and they're like, be free, mink, be free. Now, according to a Disney movie, this would sound really good, right? Like, free the mink. Let's, let's release all the farm animal. Let's release all the chickens and all the goats and all the cows and all the minks and all the and all whatever foxes or whatever is being farmed. And let them all just like, live out in the natural environment. Now, the downside about releasing minks is this. Minks need to be kept solitary because they fight with each other and they can get stressed easily. 
And they're not, they, they are very good at hunting things. So this animal rights group, although they release these minks very proudly, very happily thinking that they're saving the world, they don't realize that because they release these minks, how destructive it's going to be to the native wildlife there. Right? You know, like the, the native little creatures in, in Sweden. Yeah, now they got thousands of mink going out and hunting them. I don't think the mink can survive on themselves, so probably a good chunk of those mink went into shock or died. And uh, yeah, that is my problems with some of these animal rights groups. They, they get into this euphoria thinking that by releasing these animals, they're saving the world and no animal should be caged or, you know, all animals should be outdoors. And they don't realize like by releasing farm animals or certain creatures out there, yeah, they, they are predators. They are predators. So I'm just, I'm just waiting for one of those animal rights groups to hit up, let's say, a big pet store and say, be free, Pomeranian. Be free, Doberman. Be free. Just just go out there and live your wild, natural life. I don't know how they're going to do that. I don't know how, how any of these animals are going to live in Manhattan being free. But, yeah, there's some crazies out there. Um, they do these things, and they don't think about the consequences of their actions. It sounds nice to just release the animals out in the wild. But when you release these kind of non-native things, there's always repercussions. Always. So, so, um, Diani Vegan says, uh, just murder them instead of sending them into a sanctuary. You know, the problem with the, like, sending them into a sanctuary is, is that how, like, yeah, people might say, like, send them over to a sanctuary. How is a sanctuary going to deal with the upkeep of thousands of minks from one farm for the rest of their natural life? Now, I don't know how long a mink lives, but I imagine it's, it's probably a pretty sizable amount of time. They're going to have to be relying on donations because, uh, Feeding minks is probably not cheap. Um, I, I remember hearing what a mink was being fed in the farms, and I was thinking, like, wow, that's actually more costly than I thought it was going to be. Yeah, so, yeah, the, I heard about the PETA kill rate thing. Um, I also understand that PETA is, you know, strongly against animal rights, and I understand that they are, um, you know, obviously, you know, go vegan, not vegetarian, well, obviously go vegan, but um, one thing that I question about vegan, um, not vegan, um, PETA is, it's like, okay, what, if you're so hyper-focused on the animals, like you got to focus on the environment as well. So again, with the faux fur thing, PETA tells people to buy faux fur instead of using natural animal products. This kind of stuff, you are always, and you might, I know some people are going to criticize me and say I'm, I'm being backwards here, but there will always, always be meat eaters out there in the world. 100%. You got indigenous people, you got like the Eskimos, you got people who live in, let's say, in the middle of the rainforest. Whole Foods does not go over to them, okay? Whole Foods does not deliver over to them. So those people, they what they do is, is that when they kill an animal, you know that they're harvesting as much as they can from an animal. And I think that's the right way to go about things. If, if any animal is being killed, harvest as much as you can. A lot of like the chicken, from what I heard about in pet food, it might be um, some of the chick, chicken, chicken in pet food is like, baby chicks, you know, ground up baby chicks. So I know about that. And, you know, it's like meat byproduct, that kind of stuff. So it's not like they try to, they, they just 
they, they're not trying to reduce the amount of wastage. It's very important to reduce wastage. And one of the ways to reduce wastage is think about, okay, if there's any product coming from an animal that people are throwing away, what can you do about it? The bones from a, an animal can be used to make gelatin. It can be used for bone broth. It can be used for, I heard like, I think paint or something, was it paint? Paint has like animal byproducts in there for, um, for something. But uh, yeah, so, I, in, in my opinion, I think there is a balance. I don't think, for instance, everybody should be like 100% carnivore. Vegetables are important. But uh, yeah, it's just like, I, I hate it when there's like always a shift about saving the animals and there's like, there's no balance on there. So okay, if you save all the animals, what about the humans? Do you think humans are gonna be able to get on their nutritional need from that? Do you really think that we should get rid of all animal products and then put more plastics into the world. I personally do not believe in that. I think that we need to have less plastic in the world. We need to have less consumerism, less waste, and um, that's the way to go. And then PETA, okay, so I don't know if you guys So instead of reducing our suffering, we should just continue to harm them. If you need to harm them, like if I, if I was a farmer and there was a coyote um, going on my property, killing my chickens, I would definitely go out there and kill the coyote. Like zero, you know, zero percent chance, no. I will go out there and personally dispatch it myself. Most likely I would have to use like one of those leg traps. And as archaic as some people will say about the leg traps, coyotes are really smart. So it's not like you can just have like a box for the coyote and say, here coyote, go under the box. And then in the middle of the night, I'm going to pull the string. You see where I'm getting at? So I understand why leg traps are done for the coyotes. Now, is it barbaric? Yeah, I don't think it's the best thing for sure, but I don't really see any other solution. And I think that, I think one of the reasons why farmers continue to farm and knowing what they're doing out there to protect their animals is because they have this knowledge that a lot of city folk don't have. It's easy. It's easy to say like, oh, look how barbaric farming is or why is farming continuing and on? But when it comes down to it, farmers provide a lot of nutrition and a lot of sustenance for the community. If, if you got rid of farmers and you told them, OK, yeah, don't don't farm any animals, just farm tomatoes instead and lettuce like people are not going to be able to hit their caloric intake. Um, I think there's a certain danger if you just eat soy all day, if you just eat gluten all day. I'm talking about garden stuff. Um, a lot of garden stuff are just deep fried processed crap. Um, but yeah, it's there. There's a disconnect. There's a disconnect between how the people are, har you know, raising and harvesting our food versus, let's say, city dwellers and um, living in living in the city it's like, I don't see a lot of this stuff. So I try to look at this stuff and I try to see, you know, how is it like for people who do have to deal with coyotes, people who do live out in like the countryside and they have to deal with like boars and they have to deal with uh, foxes and like uh, ra um, not, beavers and things like that. It's, it's good to be informed about this kind of stuff now. Uh, for a person who has never seen a beaver in their life, it can be very easy to say like, why, why are these people killing the beavers? They should save the beavers. But again, as someone in, in my chat had mentioned previously, like they, they've seen the, the destruction the beaver can do. So if it comes down to between saving your property or killing the beaver, I would be 100% for killing the beaver and then try to harvest as much meat as you can from the beaver. I don't know if you can eat beaver meat. Um, or compost it. Use, it, use the compost to fertilize soil, to grow vegetables and then use the fur to, you know, make a hat or something. There is, there is harm with anything. Um, there is harm across the supply chain. You know, even if you buy something like a cotton shirt, you can't, there's going to be harm with the person who is harvesting the cotton, there might be some stuff that's going on with the people making the, the shirts and the cotton and the factory. So I don't, I don't put animals above humans, 100%, I don't do that. Um, and I, I recognize that whatever product people are consuming, there will always be harm somewhere, unless you can, you can um, 
you can look across the supply chain and say, okay, I'm going to make sure that this person isn't being exploited while they harvest this raw material or while they put this stuff together. So when I say it's always going to happen, you know, that's why I'm being very frank here. Like, I don't, we don't live in a third world country. I don't live in a third world country, so I don't know how things are. I can, I can look at something like a wooden hanger here and say, oh, well, this didn't harm anything. This is just a wooden hanger. How do I know that? How do I know how the people who are um, cutting the trees were being treated? How do I know about the people tr um, doing the metal or putting the construction? I don't know. I like to assume that people are having air conditioned places while they, while they cut down the trees, but obviously that's not the case. I think you can reduce your harm. I think you can reduce your harm by reducing, let's say, if you want to, your meat intake. But I absolutely draw the line over here when it comes down to, will you, will you cause harm to yourself because you want to be like a vegetarian? I have known people, and I'm not, you know, these are people that I've known for a good number of years. People who hold on to animal welfare so much that they put their health on the line. And then these are people who, who will be like, oh, yeah, you know, I, I don't, I don't, I have like, I haven't been able to, um, I, I have issues like with my teeth or I have issues here. And then they don't, they don't put together like their diet and what their, their diet and possibly having incomplete nutrition. So that's why I'm a big fan. I'm a big fan here. I'm like, you know what? You got to eat whatever makes you feel the best. If you feel better being a vegetarian, then go for it. If you feel better being an omnivore, go for it. If you feel better being a carnivore, go for it. But I will always prioritize humans over animals. And I, I think that you can always try to reduce harm. For instance, right, you can buy, you can buy vintage instead of getting um, new. I'm a big supporter of that. But I don't, I don't believe in this whole thing about saving the animals, la la la, no animal has to die. Uh, you know, it's just like, it's very idealistic. And when, when people, I think when people are farmers, they actually are able to say like, hey, it's a lot of work to do this kind of stuff. There, when, when lettuce is being harvested, there's, there's killing. There's insects being killed, there are animals being displaced, that sort of thing. So I don't, I don't have this whole thing about like, if you are a vegan or if you're a vegetarian, you're not causing any harm to animals. Like palm oil, for instance, right? Palm oil, I heard that it's responsible for the destruction of the rainforest. So my belief is this. I think that people should be not try to consume too much things. If they do consume things, try to be try not to try not to consume like plastic stuff. You know, we got too much plastic clothing, too much uh, plastic, 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 of course, recycle thing. You can see like we have plastic, 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 so much plastic. I, I wish that this could kind of change. But um, I, I also recognize that people should actually have more natural fibers in their life for sure. Cotton, I heard, is very intensive when it comes to resources. Um, I think water and pesticides is very high up there for cotton, but at least it biodegrades. Is your makeup animal byproduct or organic? You know, I don't know. I don't know, and frankly, I don't, I don't buy makeup based on is it vegan or not because I'm not a vegan and I'm not a vegetarian. 
it's like I look at it and I'm like, okay, you know, do, do I think this will work for me? Yes. I don't, I don't believe in going, and this is just for me, because I'm not a vegan, I'm not a vegetarian. I don't believe in going across the board and be like, I'm going to shun animal products for the rest of my life. Oh, and talking about that, right? Talking about that, I know that there's some, there, there's some people who are anti-bees over here. So when I talk about anti-bees, they'll be like, oh, bees are being exploited. But here's the thing, bees are extremely important for fruit production. You know, a lot of stuff is not gonna be able to be produced like apples and oranges if you didn't have the bees acting as pollinators. So for the people who do not support honey <laughs> or who do not support the bees, I'm like, okay, just, just go to the grocery store and buy things that don't have any bees associated with it. And you tell me how much fruits and vegetables you can eat. Bees are incredibly, incredibly um, beneficial for the environment. Oh yeah, um, whale barf, I forgot that. Ah, oh, I forgot what that is. But yeah, I remember that's that's used in perfume or something. Yeah. No, he's not he's not vegan. He's a, he's a meat eater. He's no longer vegetarian. So I'm a big fan of like yeah, so, okay, so Cubic says they buy free-range eggs. I buy free-range eggs, too. You know, we only buy free-range free range, ra free range, free range eggs, but in the event that I need eggs and there's no other option, I'll buy a cage-free. However, I am aware that cage-free might not be that good, so I don't buy cage-free thinking, like, the, the chickens can roam. I try to buy eggs where I know how much square footage is guaranteed for each chicken, but if I can't find that, then I'll go for the free range label over, you know, the traditional egg. Now, I know the traditional eggs that you can buy from the supermarket, they're usually like a dollar a dozen or a dollar 25 a dozen. Yeah, I rather I rather spend like four or five dollars and that way I feel a little better about how the chickens are um, are living. They have um, I think they're supposed to have like 100 square feet for themselves, I think, when they are for it to be considered free range. But it's kind of like a loose term. Oh, he's already tried kimchi. He's already tried sundubu, and he, he likes it. Um, uh, he tried sundubu, and he really liked it. And I was like, oh, yes, yes. <sighs> so, yeah. Anyway, anyway, I know this kind of went a little around, around and uh, for this stream. But I just wanted to share with you guys about my, my coat. And I definitely have to repair it. Uh, for being 40 to 50 years old, yeah, you can see, as Andrea mentioned, that the threads, the threads have loosened. Oh, actually, you know what? Look at that. See, there is, there is threads being, I, it looks like it's surged or something. See that? Maybe I'm saying it wrong, but it's like all these like little pieces. Yeah, little, little, little pieces. So, um, I want to restore it and then that way, yeah, I think I'm going to need some leather needles or something. But I want to restore it. Yeah, I think I'm just going to restore it myself rather than bring it to a furrier. But I don't know. I have to I have to think pros and cons over here because I think this is going to be a pretty pricey with all the holes in here. Um, I know that for furs, you're supposed to keep it within like a certain humidity-ish uh, level. Some people, they actually keep their furs in cold storage. Yes, they actually have storage just for their fur coats. For me, I'm not going to do that, obviously. Uh, I just, I just like having fur coats because it keeps me warm. I don't see this as a status symbol. And I think that to be very frank with you guys, like I'm kind of worried, like if I wear this outside, it would be like people would think I, I'm showing off, but really I'm not showing off. It's just that I like the feel of a fur coat and I like the weight of it. Um, and it's, it's comforting to wear. Um, again, if you guys, if you guys are very skeptical, skeptical about what I'm talking about, I would recommend going to a thrift store, try on a fur coat. Of course, you don't have to buy it, right? But try on a fur coat, you'll feel that weight, you'll feel that weight on your shoulders and your arm, and it's just really nice. It's really nice. Um, I've tried a lot of um, other coats, like down feather coats. It doesn't compare to a fur coat. But, 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 I don't know how a fur coat handles in the rain, so. 
Yeah, if I do wear a fur coat out, it would have to be, it would have to make, I, I would want to make sure it's it's not raining that day, of course. Um, I don't really feel too comfortable walking out on the street late at night in a fur coat. Um, I'm afraid that I'm going to get approached on the subway by some some very passionate person and uh it you know this kind of stuff happens in new york so you know, i might have this person who's like confronting me about animal rights or don't you know what happens i'm like yeah i do know what happens but <sighs> it just comes with the territory it comes with the territory and it saddens me that after after we had like faux furs created right within the last hundred of year last hundred years there is this people are anti-fur and instead of like pushing for more transparency in the fur industry or um, telling like why why people hunt or why people um, use furs, there's there's a lot of like this whole thing about like oh you know fur is so unstylish or it's not it's not nice to the animals and that kind of thing. But for people who are hunters and who do try to regulate numbers, that's the reason why there's some deer hunts going on, right? Deer hunts. Um, nutria rats other species it's it's just to like make sure that in the ecosystem runs smoothly and there's not too much destruction one way and i really hope that in the future if there are any let's say like beaver beaver um coals of sorts i don't know i don't know if there's beaver coals i hope that the state involved with it including uh, louisiana with the nutria rat they push it and they say hey you know this is this is a picture of a nutria rat this is what they do to our environment. So we have a bounty to kill each Nutria rat for $6, five or $6. And what these people do who try to save our marshlands is, is that they harvest the meat and then they use the furs and they sell it for a little bit of money. And then they can, they can make coats with, you know, made in the USA to support you know, the conservation efforts to save the marshlands and people, you know, I we hope people buy these coats because if you buy this coat, you're supporting saving our marshlands. And I, I would like to see more of a push on that. I have zero problem, zero problem buying a Nutrio Rat coat, you know, after I feel like I gotta make sure it's comfortable. <laughs> but um, I have zero, zero problems buying that because if I knew that it was helping the ecosystem, like, uh, why wouldn't I want to support that, right? Why wouldn't I want to support the small time hunter who's trying to um, save their save their um, state? No, um, biting midges don't don't eat this stuff. Not that I'm aware of. Oh goodness. Waterless glycerin than benzene cleaning fluid. Yeah, so bounty for rabbits were done for... Yeah, so I know rabbits can be very destructive for the environment too. Like not all rabbits are like Thumper in Disney. Um, some people think like, oh, rabbits are cute and cuddly. Oh, I saw rabbits at the pet store. How can people kill them? Oh, rabbits eat a lot of vegetation. <laughs> they do. So that's that's what I would like to see a push for that. I would like for um, states to take control over things and say, hey, this is this is why we do this kind of stuff. Have education, and then if people can support businesses and you know support uh, reusing things that would otherwise go to waste, I have no problem with that. Um, I really hope that Nutria fur takes off. I heard back in like the nineteen, I want to say nineteen thirties or nineteen fifties, something like that. 
Um, I don't know when Greta Garbo was around, but maybe 1950s. Uh, I heard like she used to wear like Nutria coats and uh, that used to be a stylish thing back in the day, but um, obviously it kind of fell out of favor. I don't know why. I don't know why. I don't hear too much about Nutria. I heard it's a little coarse, but I've never come across Nutria fur. I'm, I'm not too familiar with like furs in general. Um, I heard that there's like fox fur, uh, rabbit fur, I think this is rabbit fur, um, beaver fur, mink, sable fox, uh, high-end luxury stuff. And maybe one day I will walk into one of those like fur stores, you know, the used fur stores, the consignment ones, and just kind of like look at the furs. And that way I could be like, huh, okay. So this is this, okay. And if it's like this, sh if it looks like this, then it should be this. Um, I'm always, I'm always um, open to expanding my knowledge about certain furs and I want to see what's over there. I have zero intention of buying another fur coat. I, I don't need it. Um, but this fur coat, I thought, well, if that person was planning to donate it anyway, and you can tell that there does need to be work being done on this coat, and I don't mind having a little project. And I don't also mind telling people um, about you know, the, how really having a fur coat is, it's, you do have to do maintenance about it. And, but I don't think it's going to be that big of a deal. We'll see. We'll see how long this coat lasts for me. And I'm pretty happy with this. Yeah. So I will talk to you guys later and uh, I, I have to do I have to do some things around the house and uh, I got to research about how to repair this coat if I can do it myself or how much the cost to repair this thing will be. Um, yeah, who knows, maybe I'll bring it over to Manhattan and just ask them for a price 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 quote on this and then ask them like, oh, you know, uh, I am pretty sure this is rabbit fur, even though I've never seen rabbits this color in my life. Um, but I'm, I'm curious to know how much would a fur coat like this cost to repair? This was a free coat for me, but um, ongoing maintenance costs of a fur coat is something that needs to be taken into consideration. If the price is too high, then I'll just, or actually, you know, if there's any price, most likely I'll just try to fix it myself. I can learn um, a new little hobby to do. And I, I don't mind repairing fur coats. I think because there's so much anti-fur sentiment, um, as I mentioned earlier, the price of fur coats is pretty low um, and the demand is low as well because people are like, we'll just buy acrylic fur coats instead. And huh, slowly but surely, I can, uh, if I wanted to, I can have a, a collection of fur coats. But like I said, I'm pretty good with just two coats. I, I really didn't expect to get this coat today. And here, okay, so really quickly, so here's the front. It has these like cuffs over here and then it has these pockets over here. There is no brand name so I can kind of tell this is an old coat because I don't know what it is. Like even the other coat that I had that was vintage, there, there's no brand name so I wish I could tell what the brand name was. And then here is the back as well and I like it but again for a coat has um, you have to maintain it, you have to take care of it and you have to do repairs for it. And, um, but hopefully it lasts me for a good chunk of time. And if not, I can definitely rehome it. I can give it off to some rescue organization and they can use it for the animals. But, um, until then, yeah, I'm just gonna try and fix it myself and learn some new things, learn some new things about how people take care of fur coats, how people repair fur coats, the price of repair fur coats and <sighs> yeah. Uh, mute, mute, mute. Really quickly, you said stop wearing dead animals, you cycle. Are you a meat eater? Do you wear leather? Because if you do wear leather, I'm just telling you, the stuff that is attached to leather is hairs. And this is basically leather with hairs on it. I'm just being honest here. So you better, you better, be, a, you better be not a meat eater and you also better be not wearing leather. Because if you're wearing leather, you're not very far from a, wearing a fur coat. So whenever, whenever you hear people talk about like being anti-fur, I'm just going to be very frank with you guys, okay? A lot of the people who I come across that are anti-fur are the same people who have leather shoes, leather belt, leather wallet, 
And they're like, oh, 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 and they're meat eaters. So I'm like, well, hold up a second. So you're against fur, but you wear leather or you have a leather couch. Huh, huh. So you gotta go across, you gotta be across the board over here. So you can be anti-fur, you can be, you, but you better be anti-meat and you better be anti-leather as well. That's all I'm gonna say about it. See ya.